tell you everything about how well society is doing. Um, GDP was devised during the Great Depression by economists to measure um, how well the economy was recovering so that the policymakers at the time could know whether they were successful in generating more economic output, but it's not meant to tell you how well society is doing as a whole. Um, basically, this quote from Robert Kennedy, who um, in 1968 recognized that it has a lot of limitations. It doesn't measure things that are not monetary. It measures a lot of things that are monetary but aren't good. For example, if you have to spend a lot of money to clean up pollution, that goes into GDP. They don't care whether or not it's a negative or a positive contribution to society. Um, and so basically, um, policymakers have been looking beyond GDP as ways to gauge how well society is doing. So other familiar measures of objective well-being are some of these. And I mean, basically, um, the Human Development Index combines GDP with life expectancy and with, I guess, years of schooling as a sort of a broader measure. But even when you do these uh, things, you don't capture the subjective dimension. And we're going to argue here that perception does matter. Um, it's not the end all and be all, but it, when you look at the objective statistics, you need to also understand how people feel about them. So subjective well-being. You know, basic everyday questions that you all ask. And we want to know how people perceive their own lives. So from a more academic perspective, um, subjective well-being isn't determined completely by the external environment because a lot of internal factors matter as well, like your genetics, your personality. But as far as policymakers are concerned, um, they can't affect your genetics or your personality, so policymakers are left dealing with the external environment. So we want to know how people feel about the cities that they live in. And why are we focusing specifically on cities? Well, one, um, the world is rapidly urbanizing, and now we have more people living in cities than in the countryside for the first time in human history. And I think cities are more comparable to each other than countries are comparable to each other because we have uh, similar problems with providing housing, with urban planning, with vehicle congestion, pollution, sustainability, industrialization. These kinds of issues are very common to most cities and even though they have a lot of differences, there's a lot of similarities that still apply. Yet most data is still collected at the national level. I'm going to skip this. Um, so why Asia? Well, we are rapidly urbanizing, even faster than the rest of the world, besides, I think, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is also urbanizing pretty quickly. Um, and by 2050, 65% of Asia's population will be urban, which translates into millions of people, which means that um, how cities are run is going to affect the, live, um, the quality of life of a lot more people. Um, so we wanted to develop our own here rather than using something that's already been developed elsewhere because um, a lot of these measures developed in the West might not necessarily be suitable um, for the Asian situation. And I mean, you get some like, cultural things like um, earlier versions of Gallup's World Value Survey. They used to ask, um, do you believe in a personal God, which is really strange to ask a Hindu or a Buddhist because that's just that's not a concept that even computes. And we have like even small things that you wouldn't even think about. Like you ask someone in Hong Kong, how many rooms are in your house? And they go, wait, you mean bedrooms or all rooms? I mean, in the, e, uh, in the EU, when they ask this question, I assume they mean all rooms. But in Hong Kong, realtors, I mean, yeah, two rooms means two bedrooms. So you have to account for these little things as well. Um, so we did these tests um, with NGOs from five diverse Asian cities, and then we translated into seven languages and dialects. Um, and we did pilot tests with 1,100 random respondents in each city um, a couple of years ago just to basically test drive the survey to make sure it works and was understood. Um, 
Yeah, so we did some cultural compromise in here. Um, like one little funny example is when we asked people in Delhi in a focus group whether their jobs were interesting, they just laughed at the question. They thought that's a stupid thing to ask. You care about whether we can support ourselves with our jobs. We don't really expect our jobs to be interesting. What kind of a fairyland are you living in? So, um, and then we had like other issues with um, asking people like whether they had a toilet which is a perfectly valid question in Delhi, but if you ask someone in Chengdu, they just go, huh? Are you trying to offend me? Are you implying I'm some kind of a country bumpkin? So we had to sort of like finagle these little things. So um, here is how we stack up compared to various other well-known indices. There's a group of city indices over here. Uh, but they are mostly used for relocating expats, and they uh, are definitely from a Western perspective, because a lot of them include something about climate. Basically, Europeans don't like hot climates, so if you've got a hot climate, you rank low there. Um, a lot of these based on um, objective data. Some of these straddle the line. Um, subjective down here, but mostly at the national level, so we are a city-level subjective data survey. There might be others out there, but I don't know of them. So basically, we want to measure subjective well-being in Asian cities in order to determine which domain is most important to them, both personally and in terms of whether they want the government to act on it. So we ask people how much they care about these various domains, then we ask them how satisfied they are with them, and by comparing the two, you know where their priorities are and how happy they are with that area, which should, in theory, provide guidance for policy makers in terms of basically allocating resources or in doing better communications with their people. Uh, we want to be able to compare between cities. I know you can't compare um, Delhi with Hong Kong or with Tokyo, but Basically, as more cities get added to the index, we should be able to look at similar cities to learn like, how they have dealt with similar problems and to sort of more systematically choose different uh, parts of the world to learn from. Um, we want to be able to see changes in the city's priorities and satisfaction levels over time. Are things getting better or worse? And like, um, as a city develops, how do their priorities change? I mean, we know aging is an issue. As aging issue uh, happens, will we expect education to go down as a priority and, and medical care to go up? We want to see. Um, and you can use it to target specific demographics to find out which demographics are more, you know, happier about certain things, care more about certain things. So if you want to do outreach or education or interventions, um, you know who to reach out to and not just for government, but for NGOs and for businesses. So this uh, is the 10 domains. These are the 10 domains that we ask about. And what happens is that we ask everybody a set of core questions at the beginning. And then they, we ask them to choose, basically as a policy tool, um, what domain do you want the government to focus on as the number one priority and it goes into these 10, they get a bunch of questions about this specific domain, and then they go to the demographic section where everybody, again, answers all of the same questions. Now, today I'm not really going to talk about these domain-specific questions so much, I'm going to focus mostly on core. So, we did our first round in September to January of uh, last year, the beginning of this year in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Singapore, start off with because they're fairly similar in a lot of ways in that they're, you know, economically developed port cities with you know, quite a lot of international connections and trade. So we did 1,500 respondents in each city um, and we did random telephone surveying. In Hong Kong and Singapore this was landline, but in Shanghai we had to go to mobile phone because uh, nobody answers their landline. Shanghai anymore. We actually tried. We interviewed for two weeks and we got 12 cases and it was just, no, that's not working. Go to mobile phone. Um, 
One thing we did go out of our way to do was to interview these migrant workers in Singapore and Shanghai, where they make up a huge percentage of the population, so leaving them out just didn't make sense if you want to know how the city is doing as a whole. Um, and they are extremely hard to reach. They don't live in places with landlines. They have mobile phones, but if you're working on a factory assembly line, you are not answering your phone. If you're working 10, 12 hours a day in a restaurant, you are not answering your phone. So what we did was we did street intercepts with a quota for these guys, and we intercepted them on the street, we interviewed them with a survey on tablet, and we got data for them. We also uh, divided quotas by age and gender, which uh, was to ensure like, it was matched to the census in each area. So I'm just going to walk you through the key results. I'm not going to do everything that was in the report, but you'll get the main ones and some extra interesting things. So housing, medical care, and education showed up pretty high priority in all three cities, which is you know quite natural. Uh, but each city had a unique domain that top popped up in the top four. So we had quality of government here in Hong Kong as number two. Not a big deal in either of the other cities, but it's medium priority in Singapore. Um, environment popped up in Shanghai, um, mostly due to the air pollution, we think, and it was largely driven by university students. They were unusually concerned about environment compared to other occupations. And in Singapore, we get work and business opportunities, and that pops up into the top two, mostly because of these migrant workers who are there to work. So that is what they are concerned about. So this gap between the level of caring and the level of satisfaction, here we plot this as a spider diagram. And here you can see quite large gaps in Hong Kong in housing, government, education, which I didn't expect to be quite that big, and a smaller one in environmental protection. Um, see, the blue line is the caring level, Four is care a lot, one is don't care. And satisfaction is the red line. So this is what Shanghai looks like. Smaller gaps, but we still get a few. And housing actually popped up here. This shows up mostly because of these migrant workers who are living in very crowded dormitories or rented housing that is locked very bad quality. Um, and this is basically a, a level of inequality that really affects the overall score. Well, well, just just a, a small question. Uh, sorry, the Shanghai one. Mm -hmm. um, does the red uh, dot against recreation and personal time is very close to the expectation. Yeah. But you said you're, you're, you're interviewing migrants. Well, migrants should have very little recreation. Should they? Well, so it's, it's a little bit strange to me. Uh, why should they be so satisfied with the recreation and personal Well, this is everybody about? put together, the whole average. Maybe the migrant workers' proportion is only a very small part, is it? Um, well, 44%. Well, that's not small. Yeah, that's not small. So I'm, I'm quite surprised at that, at that close, the, uh, on, on, on the question of recreation and personal time. Well, we don't really know because very few people chose that as a priority. Yeah. So I mean, that was, they didn't ask whether you were satisfied with the amount, I didn't think. Yeah, I mean, I it's basically this was about in the, the city, the how satisfied policies. are you with, right. um, with, in with how much recreation you have, right? Not, uh, is, is the, the question is that how much recreation you have, are you satisfied with it? How much personal time you have, are you satisfied with it? Well, no, this about, is, no. that was um, no. not what generates this chart. Uh, we asked no, I mean against the recreation and personal time. It's not about the amount. It's not about the amount. The question no. was I a mean, very simple. I mean, the other way around, I suspect it would be, if you have time, you can spend it in many ways in Shanghai, right? Even if you're a... a, a well, you don't have worker. the time, then there's a theoretical question, right? The question that we simply <laughs> I mean, they're, asked... I they're working it flat out, you know, 10 hours or 12 hours a day, so... The question that we asked was basically thinking broadly about the city where you live, how satisfied are you with these following issues? Right. So they might not be answering based on themselves, but what they think about the city. The city. 
it's possible. I mean, or it could be that their expectation was very low. We don't really know at this point. But it's interesting that even the migrant workers are not rating too poorly, right? That we need to actually go separate them yeah. out to see how much they sink yeah. below the average. But it, it doesn't surprise me because if you, if, you, if you have any time, then it's easy to spend it in entertaining ways in a city compared to anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly if you think about this, if I had an hour in Shanghai as opposed to an hour in my rural village, mm. which would I think I could spend better? <laughs> <laughs> so Singapore was extremely satisfied, pretty much with everything, and the only reason this actually falls down a bit on housing is, again, because of these migrant workers living in very packed dorms, which the government mandates, and they're probably living 20 people to a room, we ask them how many people are there they share their space with. Um, and in a couple of areas, they actually exceed their level of caring and satisfaction. Like community, 3.1 for community, 3.0 for caring. Uh, about the same, the same for public safety, crime control, very close in environmental protection, but we have a little bit of a gap here and with medical care. So stack the city's satisfaction scores on top of each other, the average satisfaction scores, and you can see that Hong Kong is contracted in the middle. This. So we have an unhealthy pattern. Ask about the caring scores. It looks very similar. People seem to care similar amounts about most of the issues. Um, but in Hong Kong, if you ask, if you only plot the people who said that they cared a lot about these things, there's a lot fewer of them in Hong Kong. That's the blue line there. So I don't know exactly why this is. It could be because they have more civic pride in Shanghai and Singapore. People feel that they should care a lot about things. Or uh, Michael's hypothesis is that um, Hong Kong people are so frustrated they've stopped caring. <laughs> it could be a stress response. We don't know. We need to do more investigation. So we asked this rather fuzzy question, but it gives you an idea of whether people think things are progressing or declining. And um, basically, uh, this is in the newspapers, you probably saw, but 70% um, of Hong Kong Kongs think things about worse. And the percentage in Shanghai and Singapore is actually very tiny. Um, I mean, Shanghai is pretty much the wealthiest city in mainland China, and, and people who live there, they still, rem if they're about the age of 50 or so, they remember the days when you were allowed to eat one chicken per year, oh, and rationing. You got the chicken for New Year for your whole family to share. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. There, Singapore is a little, you know, a bit more difficult to explain in context. Um, this was done shortly after Lee Kuan Yew died, so they were probably, you know, flooded with patriotism at that point, but the size of the gap here is just huge, so we need to figure that out. Um, in terms of you uh, split it up with Shanghai residents and non-residents, you get similar answers, but Shanghai residents get more extreme answers, probably because they've been around longer, so they have more of an opinion, but odd thing here is in Singapore, the non-citizens are significantly more positive than the citizens. I don't really know why that is, considering these non-citizens that we interviewed were pretty much mostly low-wage workers living there on temporary visas, doing quite, you know, basic jobs in, in retail, in, in construction, in factory work. Which I have a theory. Because Singapore threw out the bus drivers who went on snow. <laughs> <laughs> so the unhappy ones were kicked out. Probably. <laughs> well, and, and another question, another reason is the comparison. Because the migrants, they are all escaping from what they had had mm -hmm. in the past. So they're comparing what they had in the past mm -hmm. with what they have now. Mm -hmm. Even what they have now is not perfect, it's much better than what they had in the past. That's before. possible, but we so, don't really see that in Shanghai where people are coming from poor rural areas. It does say become a better well, place, better. not your life. Is yes, better. it's yeah. about the place, so maybe it's just they just think that. But living more. includes life in general, right? Not no. Just, not just physical accommodation. You're asking right? about. Living. Living in 
since uh, since you no, 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 since you started writing this city, has, has a, a city a become a better or worse place, place to live? The whole city, not just your house or your life, yeah. the whole city. Well, the whole city. The whole city. Well, well, has it become a better or worse place to live? But then we have a separate question, which is how satisfied is your life, which is very personal. Yeah. But this one is, what do you think? Of the place. Is, right. Of the place. I would submit that the reason why such high levels of acceptance and satisfaction in Singapore is a sovereign country, and they beat their patriotic drum constantly 24 hours. Oh, we certainly have well, a lot of positive publicity about what the Singaporean government well, Shanghai is also a sovereign country, so, I mean, it's in China, so. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> but, so, uh, but, so, so, graphically, like, for Shanghai, the migrant work is mostly from rural China, yeah. but for, for Singapore, it's mostly from India, Bangladesh, or yeah. Yeah. places. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So it's the ones different. we got, because of the only seven languages we had, were mostly um, uh, from Philippines and India. You take into account the, the number of years that they have been in the city. We did ask that, but we have to co crunch that data. That we will look into that in the city reports. And there might not be quite enough of them to. But I, but there is a problem with that question, actually, which is that the time frame is different for every person. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. a fuzzy, fuzzy yeah. general question. Uh, according to Michael, he says that people are going to give fuzzy answers anyway, so you might as well ask a fuzzy <laughs> question. <laughs> Nobody has lived through a war here. Well, 
That's true. No, but they live, they, they, it was for the post war years, yeah. right? Yeah, no, but it was so not, they, still not a Babin, Babin, sorry. Yeah. Because you've been excluded the 65, over 65. So. Remember, Hong Kong's uh, economy took off when? In the 70s, right? Yeah, yeah. 60s. Right, so 50s, 50s, 60s. Well, at least 60s. Yeah, exactly. years, right, and even right, before, right, you know, right, right. Um, when Shenzhen was a paddy field. Right, right. And right. then when the Cultural Revolution, you see corpses flowing down the Fur River, right? Right, right. Exactly. So I, I went through all this, you know, right. sort of uh, water rations and. Right. But um, it, 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 the, the point I was trying to make is there was a, a timeline comparison yes. as well. Yes. So even if you do data in Hong Kong, if you ask people whether they're happy now, and then you use the same question and ask people if you can go back in time, say 50 years ago, you have completely different results. Um, you know, the attitudes are different, yeah. aspirations are yeah. different, yeah. and which leads me to the second point, which haven't, doesn't seem to feature here. Um, I think many of you would, 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 would have heard about or have studied the kind of, uh, this is old hat anyway, um, uh, the, the levels of um, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a self actualization, for example, it's a higher level rather than just a roof over your head and physical matters. And the self actualization is the way you have got opportunities to exert yourselves mm -hmm. and your aspirations and that kind of thing. So, if you have a question uh, asking about you know, your uh, self actualization, I think you have very different results, even the physical conditions are vastly different. I think last time we made a big presentation, uh, make the point that. In some war-torn countries like uh, Iraq and, and so on, people seem to be happier for some reason. I mean, there was an international comparison because they accepted that. Oh, they lived, they lived through all these war-torn years. And if, if uh, for a certain period, um, the, the kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, rough and tumble sort of uh, subsided, they're relatively happier. So, um, and then that some people have very low expectations about material comfort. So if they don't need a toilet, but if they have a family, you know, living together, uh, and even though they're, 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 they're living from hand to mouth, they're quite happy. So I think that all these are, have a very different impact on the survey. Yeah, so we, we can get into that a bit later. Yeah. Um, all right, so Singapore pattern is different when you look at it by age. Um, the older people are more likely to think that Singapore has gotten better as a place to live, but you don't get this negativity among the young. It doesn't, you know, the red doesn't go down. It actually peaks at 40 to 49. Um, single, Shanghai was kind of all over the place, so I didn't show the graph. So yeah, apparently being older makes you more optimistic somehow. So we ask people, is your city a good place for children to grow up or not? And yes. <laughs> Relative to the rest of China, yes. but not on an absolute I mean, basis. They're still very to competitive. The rest of China, they're not comparing themselves internationally necessarily. But when we ask people about retirees, is New York City a good place for retirees to live? Um, actually, all three cities show a significant proportion who say no. Um, it's you know, 37 percent Shanghai and 39 percent here in Singapore. So aging is a, a problem that seems to cut across all of these societies. And I mean, people are willing to tell us that they think that it's not a good place to be old. So what we did was um, we plotted whether you think Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai are a good place for children against whether you think overall the cities have become better or worse on the scale. And so basically a perfect correlation is this, this dotted line. Like everybody who thinks your city's gotten much better says it's good for children and nobody who thinks it's much worse thinks it's good for children. Now Hong Kong's line is, is pretty close to that perfect correlation. Um, it's much flatter in Singapore and Shanghai. Even people who think that their city's gotten much worse, they still over half of them say it, it's still all right for kids. And we did the same thing for retirees, and it's you know, much closer there. Um, Shanghai is much flatter, so there's not much of a correlation. Um, Hong Kong. 
have an issue with aging, and I think this is something that they're going to be dealing with in the future. So then we asked people, how worried are you about these two things, poverty in your city and being able to provide for you and your family's daily needs? So the first question is social, the second is personal, and you get differences. If you look at Hong Kong like this, a lot of people worried about poverty, about you know, a little less than half worried about supporting their families. In, in Shanghai, um, it's actually slightly more people worry about their families than they are about poverty. And in Singapore, you get similar. It's like over half people of people in Singapore are worried about supporting their families, and yet at a societal level, less than half think it's a problem. So if I can just interject here. So just this slide, it's about poverty. If we look at the bottom half of the slides, and if we assume that when respondents answer the question, do you worry about being able to provide for your family's daily needs as an indication of whether they might have a poverty issue, it will look like Hong Kong actually, the people actually are not as poor as Singapore. But if you look at the upper half, do you worry about poverty as a city issue for your society? Hong Kong generally think that poverty is an issue for Hong Kong. Now, the, I, 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 I think this is really interesting. I think Korean thinks this is really interesting too, especially versus Singapore. Singapore actually, you know, somehow they don't think that only less than half of the people think poverty is an issue in Singapore. But if you look at their personal experience, it's slightly more than half. Hong Kong is the reverse. Now, and we know that our government talks a lot about you know, anti-poverty, right? What, it, Andrew and John, what is your take on this? Does this tell you something wrong or something interesting or something that hasn't been picked up about Hong Kong? Are we, are we exaggerating the poverty issue in Hong Kong because of media? Or something else. How do you how how do you well, read this? The, the thing that strikes me immediately, comparing the top half or the bottom half, um, the kind of worry kind of thing in the case of Singapore is exactly thirty three percent worry. All right, and then four, uh, fourteen percent is uh, very worry. But then the, between the, the the worry and the very worry, you add them together, is forty seven up there, and it's uh, fifty three uh, mm -hmm. down there. The difference is not that great, but in the case of worry category, it's exactly the same. This shows that Singapore could be uh, a more, uh, I, I wouldn't say there was no social uh, income inequality, but it seemed to be relatively compared to Hong Kong. Um, the city poverty is a big problem because of inequalities. Um, a lot of people are poor, and then those who are poor are very poor. They live in... Um, Subdivided units. Uh, they, some of people have to, older people have to pick up rubbish, so that worries people as a city. But then individually, they find that they, um, because uh, the correspondents may not be all poor, uh, so if you ask them that whether they are able to provide for family daily needs, um, the uh, response seems to be uh, less, you know, so on the worry side. I think that's the problem. That is a reflection of social um, and inequalities. So you think Hong Kong is greater inequality? Well, we don't know that. that. I mean, no. I, I have to say, I think that's speculation. We don't know. We can't tell no. from this alone. It could just as easily be that Hong Kong people are more sensitive to the needs of society. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I think that is a better explanation. The honest answer is we don't know. The bottom line is, I think, the one that tells us what people can answer honestly themselves. The top line, what does it mean to say I'm worried about poverty? That's an abstract conception, mm. and it, there's no action attached, so anybody can say that. So I, it could just be an entirely a socially desirable response. Mm. So I don't, I don't consider the top line to be very helpful. Okay. I think the bottom line is the one that matters. Okay. 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 But, but uh, apart from the survey, uh, Hong Kong is a much more unequal city compared to Singapore, right? Uh, uh, looking at the Gini coefficient. Probably on the top end, for huh? sure, right? Well, Hong Kong's Hong Kong. richest 0.1% yeah, like is it's, richer than Singapore's 0.1%. No, 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 not income per capita. I'm, I'm talking about Gini coefficient, inequality, income dis distribution. But Shanghai is yeah. certainly unequal, and it doesn't show up here at all. Yeah. 
right? So that, that says this is about, it's all about perception, frankly. Yeah, I think it's mm. probably a perception thing. The fact that very few to... people in Shanghai care, care about poverty in the city. Mm. So much for communism. <laughs> <laughs> So we ask, 
I mean, this is, okay, I'm just going to say this up front. This is an aspirational question. This is, in an ideal situation, if you had total freedom to choose, would you choose to live here or would you choose to go away? And this is not like tied to your ability to go, your, your ability to find a job somewhere, all these sort of practical considerations. We kind of prompted them to not think about, so this is just, do you want to be here ultimately? Or do you feel like you're stuck? And um, Hong Kong has quite a large, much larger proportion of people who would ideally want to leave. And I mean, we do have a very strong history of um, migration. We have historically left in very large numbers. It's basically a refugee um, history. And then a lot of people was treating Hong Kong as a stepping stone. So we would expect it to be higher anyway. But we're going to look at um, how it's actually tied to dissatisfaction in Hong Kong. So, OK, um, one possible reason people might want to move is because they have more international exposure. They've seen more of the world. They know about more of the world. And they, they want to go. But uh, we ask people, OK, do you actually have um, close relatives living abroad? And um, whether you have close relatives living abroad or not kind of makes minimal to no difference about whether you would prefer to stay or leave. So yes, relatives abroad, no. It's pretty much the same. It's like a couple percentage difference. It's pretty much not a factor. Corinne, I want to make sure we have a lot of time for Q&A. Um, so. Do you think we can kind of cut here? Because th these are kind of more embellishments. Um, especially for Andrew, um, who is a <coughs> seasoned senior government official. If you look at headline findings like this and putting your government officials hat on, does this tell you anything interesting? Also, or is like, ah, oh, we already know this and there's nothing to be worried about? No, no, because the, these surveys are based on uh, data uh, and also, um, well, I mean, reasonably um, professional uh, methodologies. Uh, so that, that does tell um, the story that Hong Kong is a very unhappy city compared to the Shanghai and Singapore, obviously. I mean, even though there was a migrant kind of mentality, I, I was expect that uh, you will find this high percentage proportion of people who won't leave. I mean, but well, that's my point. I mean, you've got to have two longitudinal studies. Yes, time-based. Um, right. So as to, to find out you know, whether yes. in the same city you have more people who are yeah, Actually, um, um, I saw a column by Ma Ma, and um, the Asian barometer mm -hmm. actually asked a very similar question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the proportion of people who say they want to leave has actually risen over the last 10 years. Risen? Yes. Well, well that, that's the point. So, uh, and, and also, um, mm -hmm. compared to even Shanghai, I mean, Shanghai is not an, actually an ideal city. There are lots of problems. And if you say that you're interviewing so many migrants, mm -hmm. even mi some migrants are happy. Mm -hmm. So the question is why? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, it leads, leads me to another uh, uh, question which I have reserved until now. Uh, that one important factor which doesn't seem to, to, to be highlighted mm -hmm. in the survey uh, is freedom. <laughs> we had the same question in the last right? session. Yes. Yeah. So you, it doesn't yes. feature in any of them. Yes. And now, of course, freedom is a relative thing. Mm -hmm. um, you can't have absolute freedom. But of course, the freedom um, is, the, is, is the ability to, mm -hmm. to, to realize yourself. It's mm -hmm. kind of self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Freedom doesn't mean as action. It's freedom to uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom to take uh, political actions, and things like that. And then, and then of course, it, 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 it really differs from society to society. Actually, yeah. you're right. There is, I saw there's a freedom in that uh, done by International Freedom House. Hong Kong ranks number one. In, in, that in what? Freedom. Kind of civil freedom. But they don't do it by a survey. You can't do that by a survey. Uh, so in any way, maybe it's not number one, maybe it's, but by freedom, seems Hong Kong ranks pretty high. But yeah. the question is, well, if Hong Kong is indeed one of the freest cities, places in the world, why do people not feel it's a good place to live? Well, I mean, we can't a, explain a, it. So but, do, 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 how do you define freedom? I mean, for example, the, uh, according to um, uh, the World Economic Forum and what's this kind of data survey in Switzerland um, with the IMD, uh, the uh, Economic Index or something, mm -hmm. Hong Kong 
is the freest economy in the world. It's the freedom to do business, freedom to make money. Yeah, it's free. You know? And then, of course, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's freedom economic travel. freedom. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, there's right. economic freedom, no, no, but they, also there's a ton of very general social freedom. freedom right. Right? So I think that so that Hong Kong you know, yeah. rates pretty high. Hong Kong is the, the, you know, the judiciary, is a, it's the rule of law, it's international respect and all that. Mm -hmm. But why is people unhappy? Mm -hmm. um, so I from a government point, if you were you in the government yeah. today and you look at this, yeah. can you can you speculate? What they would think. Or well, I think I think a lot of the senior people in the government know, right. um, and then I think if we throw this out in the open, um, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion in the, in the media and say, hey, you know, I told you so. The government is so you know so uh, so backward, and they're going to don't follow the uh, uh, the aspirations of the people, mm -hmm. um, and they are the, uh, and, and that's why there was a, a, a data to show mm -hmm. uh, that there was a great of, of dissatisfaction mm -hmm. with how well the government is performing. You know, because uh, in the earliest well, slides, right, the in Hong Kong, yeah. compared have, to the Shanghai. Do we have someone here from the CPU? Yeah. Do we have someone here from the CPU? It was on the list. I thought that was the earlier slide. Oh, was, okay, maybe. So, um, I also noticed that we have a good number of younger people here. I'm really interested to hear how kind of the younger members of the audience react to this. I'll, I'll just share my views of someone who's quite new to Hong Kong um, at six months here. But talking to people my age, I'd say it relates to your topic about self actualization the, the degree to which you think your life will improve in the future. And, and people worry about having children, starting families, um, and you know, education and housing are, are major issues. If they work really, really hard in a city where you have to work really, really hard, you might be able to get your kid into a very expensive preschool where they can work really, really hard and then not be able to afford a house after 20 years. So it's, it's, it's kind of that kind of freedom to build a comfortable life um, that I think is one of the major issues while well, talking to young people. And, and, and related to the kind of unhappiness in Hong Kong is the perceived or the lack of empowerment. Mm -hmm. You know, most people feel that they, they, don't, they don't have they can't control their own future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their aspirations are being, their opportunities are being, you know, sort of uh, encroached upon, mm -hmm. um, and the upward mobility is being, there are so many barriers. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of uh, also self actualization, but also empowerment. The lack of empowerment, the people feel rather helpless. And then the, the government is not going to help them, mm -hmm. um, the society is full of uh, you know, Western interests, that kind of thing. So that, for our expatriate friends who live in Hong Kong now, does this bother you? Do you think this will affect like other expatriates, affect their thinking of coming to Hong Kong, despite Brexit? <laughs> well, I, I was surprised how um, pessimistic the city was coming here. Where are you from? I'm, I'm from Australia, but I spent oh. three years in Jakarta before here. I have oh. to say, it's a very Jakarta is very poor. Uh, but it's very optimistic. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that, it's very surprising. So my, my question is, would, would be um, how much longitudinal data, not, not exactly these questions, but even the, the Gallup stuff about how happy you with your life, has that changed over the last 20, 10 to 20 years? Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd be interested to see, is this pessimism that I see in the city a new thing um, to do with, I don't know, the... the the le less freedom people feel about and the worries they have about mainland China? Or is this more to do with living conditions and, and a gradual process? I think there are, there's a couple of points. So, so 1997 is a break point, right? So it's very interesting. If you look at the data that Robert Schoen collected before and after 1997, you discover there's a critical difference. And it wasn't actually really anything to do with Chris Patton or C.H. Tom. It's that before 1997, a significant proportion of the population basically didn't care about the government. Right? So they all bought into this idea of Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong. So come 1997, it's in theory Hong Kong person ruling Hong Kong. So yes, now suddenly we're going to express a view. So it's not that the views changed that much, but that there were the people who wouldn't answer before now said, yeah, I'm going to express a view. So that's one, one change. Now, the other issue here is the context of this 
I believe is at least partly Singapore was at this euphoric peak, ironically, after Al Qaeda's death. Hong Kong was at a, a low point, particularly low point, I think, post Occupy Central. It's so, clear, but still, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think Except that's I think that's still having an effect now. Right. Whether you think things will go back up again, I think, is, is speculation. I think nobody really knows. But definitely this is a low point relative to since 1997. I think that's, yes. that's undeniable. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, you know, what, what will happen later on? Who knows? I think the issue, though, is, again, this is about perception, and it's also about media. So the media, I agree with freedom. Freedom specifically the media freedom. So in Singapore... The Straits Times will not run negative stories of this sort of nature. You wouldn't get negative stories like that here. Anything goes. Now, is it cause or is it effect? That's that's hard to separate. That you isolate. Right, and in Shanghai, well, you, again, this sort of story wouldn't wouldn't happen. You would be locked yeah. up. I can tell you though that um, according to Gallup, World poll data, which asked that satisfaction with life question. Um, before the Arab Spring broke out in Egypt and Tunisia, they did see a dip in life satisfaction. In which country? In Tunisia and Egypt. In those places? Yes, oh, right. so people were less happy with their lives. Well, because it, it definitely their lives got yeah. worse in the short term, yeah. even yeah. if they had political freedom. Yeah. In many other ways, their life got worse. I mean, be before, massive, before it happened. Yeah, know, but I mean, it was a massive increase in uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. How do you feel about uncertainty as opposed to reality? It's very hard to separate that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. And, and also, when you ask people about the perception, it's always relative about how they're doing with each other. Like, for uh, example, when you ask people who are in less well-off places about whether they're happy with their life, if everyone is miserable, they feel okay. 